we were talking about the digestive system and in last class I talked about the first organ of the digestive system which is the mouth right and you know that after the mouth next structure or organ is the pharynx <coughs> food passes through the pharynx and then enters into the esophagus our pharynx has three parts nasopharynx oropharynx laryngopharynx right so we have talked about the food passes through the oropharynx then laryngopharynx and then enters into the esophagus esophagus is the narrow tube that takes the food from the pharynx to the stomach from the pharynx to the stomach anyway so we will first talk about the esophagus then we will talk about the stomach then we will talk about the small intestine, large intestine, liver, pancreas. Those organs of the digestive system. First, esophagus is a flat, narrow, muscular tube from the laryngopharynx to the stomach. Esophagus passes through the diaphragm before it enters into the stomach. So, this is the diaphragm and esophagus passes through the diaphragm then enters into the stomach. So, this is the esophagus. And where the esophagus passes through the diaphragm, that opening the diaphragm is called hiatus. Hiatus. The opening for the esophagus in the diaphragm. And the entrance of esophagus into the stomach, this is called the cardiac orifice. But the esophagus enters into the stomach. This opening is called cardiac orifice. So, hiatus is the opening in the diaphragm. Now, sometimes what happens, this opening gets big. and a small part of stomach can pop out okay small part of stomach can move up through that big opening that is space and that is called hiatal hernia hiatal hernia Hernia refers to any dislocation of the body parts. If any body parts move from its normal to abnormal position, it is called hernia. So, since the part of the stomach is moving away to the hiatus, that is called hiatal hernia. innermost layer of the esophagus is mucosa. We know that GI tract has four layers, right? Mucosa, submucosa, muscular is externa and outermost is serosa. So, mucosa contains stratified squamous epithelium. Why stratified squamous? You already know that esophagus is a narrow tube, right? And food 
passes through the esophagus. So friction occurs, right? So stratified squamous for protection. <coughs> In the wall of the esophagus, you have esophageal glands and that esophageal glands secrete mucus and that mucus makes the surface slippery so the food bolus can quickly enter into the stomach quickly pass through the esophagus and enter into the stomach <coughs> in the wall of the esophagus you have this smooth you have two types of muscles this is interesting in the upper part of esophagus you have the skeletal muscle and in the lower part of the esophagus you have a smooth muscle so in esophagus you have both skeletal and smooth muscle in the upper part you have the skeletal and in the lower part smooth the contraction of muscle causes peristalsis type movement in the esophagus. You already know different types of movements, right? Peristalsis, you remember I said if you put a ring inside the tube and move like this, like wave like movement, one after another, that is peristalsis. So two things quickly move the food bolus from the pharynx to the stomach. One is mucus makes the surface smooth, uh, slippery and number two peristalsis contraction those two moves the food bolus very fast to the stomach here you see the cross section of the esophagus so you have four layers mucosa Submucosa, muscularis externa, and here the outermost layer is not serosa. The outermost layer is called adventitia. <coughs> you must remember from last lecture, I told you that peritoneum, the visceral layer of peritoneum, covers the abdominal organs, right? But esophagus is not abdominal organ. It is here, right? So, figures is not in abdomen, in the thorax. So, peritoneum doesn't come here. Peritoneum is in the abdomen, makes sense? So, that's why no visceral peritoneum is here. So, that's why the name is different. The outermost layer is called not serosa but adventitia. Deglutition is also called swallowing. The process of swallowing is also called deglutition. For swallowing of the food bolus, you need the help of the tongue that initiates the swallowing. The tongue initiates the swallowing. You push the food by your tongue. Then soft palate, pharynx, esophagus, and 22 muscle groups. All those things help in swallowing. Now swallowing or deglutition has two phases. Buccal phase or buccal phase, which is voluntary, you know all. After you make the food bolus inside the mouth, you push the food towards the pharynx, right? You push the food, you start swallowing, push the food towards the pharynx. It is voluntary, right? If you decide, I will not swallow it, I will keep it inside my mouth for a long time, you can do that, right? If you decide, you can push it. 
So that part inside the mouth is the voluntary part. And second part is the pharyngoesophageal phase or pharyngeal esophageal phase. This is involuntary. Once you push the food into the pharynx, then it, you don't think anything else, right? Your task is what? Every time you eat, you just push the food backwards, right? Then you don't think where it is going. You know that it will go to the stomach by itself, right? So that part is involuntary. It happens involuntarily and this phase is controlled by the centers in the medulla and lower forms. Now, the swallowing is initiated by the tongue. You see the footballers inside the mouth. We push the front part of the tongue against the palate. You know, palate is the roof of the mouth, right? So we push the front part of the tongue against the hard palate. And that moves the food bolus backwards towards the pharynx. When the food is in the mouth, you see the upper end of the esophagus shown by two arrows where you have the upper esophageal sphincter at the upper end of the esophagus. When the food is in the mouth, that sphincter is closed. Now, after you push the food towards the pharynx, the food is now in the pharynx. When the food moves towards the pharynx, you see here, one thing is very important here, the soft palate and uvula moves up. Here you see the uvula, here you see the soft palate and uvula move up to close the opening. So the food will not enter into the nasopharynx, will not move up because the uvula has closed that opening. So food will move downwards. That is very important. You know, if food enters into the nose, nasal cavity is very painful, right? It's, it's a very discomforting. So, when you swallow, the uvula moves up. And another thing happens, you see, the upper esophageal sphincter gets opened to let the food bolus enter into the esophagus. Then, when the food bolus is entirely inside the esophagus, the upper esophageal sphincter will get closed again. You see the arrows. Make sense? Why? Cannot go back. Should not go back, right? Because it should go down. So, the food has no way to move up. It will go down. And will go down very fast because I have already mentioned why the surface of the esophagus is simple <coughs> to mucus, remember? And contraction is peristalsis, right? So those two things will move the food bolus very quickly towards the stomach. And the food bolus will move by peristalsis type contraction towards the stomach. Peristalsis is the moment. Here you see the lower end of esophagus has another sphincter that is called gastroesophageal sphincter. Gastro means stomach, right? And esophagus. So, where the esophagus ends in the stomach. You have a sphincter that is called the gastroesophageal sphincter. That is closed when the food is going downwards. So 
to the esophagus. When the food approaches the stomach, comes close to the stomach, the gastroesophageal sphincter gets open to let the food get in. Okay, so food bolus will enter into the stomach. So that's how the deglutition or swallowing of the food occurs. You can close the door. <clears throat> okay, now we'll talk about the stomach. Stomach is the most dilated part of the gastrointestinal tract, right? Most wider part of the gastrointestinal tract. The function of the stomach is storage of food. That's why it is big. To store the food, stuff, and number two, digestion of food. Inside the stomach, food stuffs are stored for hours. And the secretion and movement of the stomach, secretion in the stomach and movement of the stomach uh, help in the digestion of the food. So those are two functions, storage and digestion. <coughs> Take down. Now, anatomy of the stomach. Stomach has different parts. Cardiac part or cardia, fundus, body and pylorus or pyloric part. So those are the parts. I am repeating again. Cardiac part or cardia. Fundus. Body. And pyloric part. Now, you see here. Cardiac part is the area around the entrance of the esophagus. So this is the esophagus. This is the stomach, right? So this area is called the cardiac area or cardia. This dome shape, dome shape part of the stomach is called the fundus. Okay? Dome shaped part. Then most part in the middle is called the body. What is the widest part here? And then the last part is called the pyloric part. Now, pyloric part has two parts. If I just draw an imaginary line here, the first part you see is wider, the last part is narrow. This first part of pyloric part is called the pyloric antra. Pyloric antra is the first part. Okay, the wider first part of the pyloric. Region. And the last narrow part that is called the pyloric canal. The pyloric canal. The so whole pylorus has two parts pyloric antrum is first wider part, and then pyloric canal, last narrow part. And you have the sphincter here that is called pyloric sphincter. Sphincter. Okay. So those are the parts of the pyloric region. 
Now, <coughs> there are two borders in the stomach. This border, you see, is long. This one is bigger. This is called the greater curvature. And this one, you see, is smaller. That is the lesser curvature. So two curves, greater and lesser. Those are the borders. In the stomach, you have four layers. We know in GI tract, we have four layers, right? From inside to outside, mucosa, submucosa, musculus external, and serosa. Make sense? In the stomach, the muscularis externa has three layers. All other structures of your GI tract, for example, your esophagus, small intestine, large intestine, everywhere in muscularis externa, you have inner circular, outer longitudinal. You remember, inner circular, outer longitudinal. Two layers of a smooth muscle. In your stomach, you have three layers. What is the other layer? That's the oblique. The fibers are like this. So, innermost layer is oblique fibers. Then you have circular and then outermost is longitudinal. Okay, yeah. Di yeah, diagonal. Oblique, yeah. So, in the stomach, you have an additional muscle layer. That is the innermost one, oblique layer. <coughs> so, the stomach wall can move in more directions. Make sense? The contraction occurs along the direction of the fibers. Make sense? Because if the fibers are round, then contraction will occur this way. Make sense? To make it narrow. If the fibers are longitudinal, Contraction will occur this way, right? Tube will get shorter. Oblique, that means will like spiral movement. Make sense? So, different types of movements can occur in the wall of the stomach. To mix the chemicals and the food stuff. In the mucosa, of the stomach, which is the innermost layer, you will see foldings, mucosal foldings. Those foldings of mucosa is called, are called rugae. So rugae are the foldings of the mucosa in the inner surface of the stomach. Now, Rugae or those foldings increase the surface area inside the stomach. Make sense? If you just take a piece of, you know, big piece of cloth, if you fold it like this, like the cotton, right? You can make it small. But total surface area, if you spread it, is big. Make sense? So, the foldings do what? Increase the, make the surface area big. Yes, when you eat more, stomach gets bigger, right? So the rugae gets get less prominent. Make sense? Because they get more like flat. So when the stomach is empty, the rugae gets more what? Prominent. Clear, visible, right? More clear. When you make it big, will get, yeah, more flat. Okay. <clears throat> Another thing, the epithelial lining of the mucosa is simple columnar. In esophagus, you remember, it was what? Stratified squamous because friction, right? But the stomach is big, white, so no chance of friction. Very little chance of friction. And another thing in the stomach, the food stuff is now very liquid because of a lot of secretion. It's like liquid. Okay, so the 
epithelial lining is simple columnar. Momentum. Momentum are there are two lesser and greater momentum connective tissue membrane and that membrane connects the liver to the lesser curvature of the stomach. You see this is the stomach <coughs> and you know the stomach has two borders lesser curvature and greater curvature is here. So this is the lesser curvature of the stomach and this is the liver. So the connective tissue membrane it is actually a double layered structure that connective tissue membrane connects the liver to the lesser curvature of the stomach that is called lesser momentum because it is attached to the lesser curvature. And then what happens is see if this is the stomach and this is the liver from the liver that membrane goes to the lesser curvature of the stomach right? and then it covers the stomach like this the whole stomach first gets attached to the lesser curvature and then covers the whole stomach and gets fused in the other side where you have the greater curvature right so meet in the other side and then what happens from the greater curvature you see here your greater curvature of the stomach is here and it drafts down like this like a you know table cloth or bed sheet that drafts down make sense so and hangs like this okay so hangs like this and so from the greater curvature it drafts down and hangs like this and that is the greater momentum so the lower end of greater momentum is free right upper end is attached to the greater curvature yeah free lower end is free now what's the function of the greater momentum you see here greater momentum goes down from the data curvature of the stomach and covers the abdominal organs make sense so protection all I see here your abdominal organs you have the greater momentum hanging here hanging here and you have abdominal organs here right so protecting the abdominal organ if something hits from the front the greater momentum will protect right so protection number one number two lot of fat accumulates on the greater momentum and the fats sometimes form a thick pad of fat thick layer of fat right so if you eat more fat accumulates more there right and you know that the stomach has, gets big some people will see big stomach lot of fat accumulates there so storage of fat and the layer of fat thick layer of fat here provides cushion cushion and insulate insulation so the heat cannot easily get out make sense you know insulation we use in the house so your fat thick layer of fat works as insulator and will not let the heat get in or out from the stomach or from outside so those are some important functions of your greater momentum here they have dissected the greater momentum that's why you don't see you just see the starting here <coughs> okay now uh, 
if you see the layers in the wall of the stomach innermost layer is mucosa we all know that and you also know that from last class mucosa has three sub layers surface epithelium or epithelial layer then lamina propria and muscular is mucosa if you see the surface epithelium of the mucosa of the stomach you have different types of cells they are shown here by different colors in the surface epithelium you have different types of cells you tell me few minutes ago i told you the epithelial lining of the stomach is what cell out simple columnar right so most of the cells are simple columnar cells most of the cells are what simple columnar and simple columnar cells are mostly present in the outer part of the epithelium outer part in the inner part of epithelial lining you have other types of cells you see by different colors and another thing is this inner part you see here the simple columnar cells the outer part simple columnar these are simple columnar cells and in the inner part you have other cells and this inner part is called the gastric gland you probably have heard the term gastric gland what is gastric gland the inner portion of the surface epithelium where you have different types of cells which cells you have you have mucus cells parietal cells chip cells and entero endocrine cells so those are the cells in the gastric gland that means the inner part of the epithelium now here you see more clear <coughs> you see the gastric gland part inner part where you have those cells mucus cells parietal cells chip cells and entero endocrine cells in the gastric gland the top part is called the gastric pit and in the gastric pit you have mostly simple columnar cells and inside that part you have the passages passages opening now you see here what happens from this gastric gland part these cells secrete the chemicals and the chemicals after secretion gets out to the gastric pit and here you have the food stuffs this is inside the stomach right so these cells secrete the chemicals and through the gastric pit and then through the gastric yeah through the gastric pits these are the openings of the gastric pits this is one opening here these are other chemicals enter into the stomach yeah that is one one secretion yeah. yes right right that we'll talk about that okay so uh, you are right uh, the gastric gland cells secrete right pepsinogen and hydrochloric acid those chemicals are secreted those are the chemicals so here you see the chip cells secrete pepsinogen okay and the parietal cells secrete hydrochloric acid hcl now pepsinogen is an inactive chemical 
make sense inactive chemical to convert it to active pepsin you need what hydrochloric acid so hydrochloric acid will convert the inactive pepsinogen to active pepsin then what happens the active pepsin what some pepsinogen and activate more pepsinogen to pepsin convert more pepsinogen to pepsin so that's how the pepsinogen is converted to pepsin and those are the main secretions of the gastric tract entero endocrine cells entero endocrine cells secrete the hormone that stimulates the chip cells and parietal cells to secrete the pepsinogen and hydrochloric acid so entero endocrine secretion directly stimulates the other cells and also enters into the blood from there entero endocrine secretion goes to the blood and then comes back and stimulates the other cells so two ways the entero entero endocrine secretion stimulates the other cells of the gastric gland one is directly because those cells are inside the gland so the secretion will directly stimulate right those cells to secrete pepsinogen and hydrochloric acid <coughs> some entero endocrine secretion will enter where into the blood and will come back again to the wall and will stimulate the cells to release the chemicals <coughs> gastritis and peptic ulcer uh, we very often here are those terms gastritis is the inflammation caused by anything in the mucosal layer or mucosa and in gastritis we see redness inflammation causes redness so if you take the picture using camera right put the camera inside the stomach and see the inner surface of the stomach you will see what redness inflammation that is gastritis right but you won't see injury there redness now gastric or peptic ulcer is the erosion of the wall stomach wall if you see the lesion in the stomach wall from where the bleeding can occur that is the peptic ulcer and now we know that most of the cases peptic ulcer or gastric ulcer occurs due to prolonged presence of a bacteria that is called helicobacter pylori that one can stay years after years in your stomach and cause the lesion in the stomach wall okay regulation of gastric secretion the secretion in the stomach is regulated by neural and hormonal mechanisms you know that the food stuffs stay inside the stomach for long time stay inside the stomach for long time and the secretion occurs in the stomach we have just seen the secretion of pepsinogen hydrochloric acid right enter into endocrine secretion secretion occurs in the stomach now how that secretion 
is controlled. 2x, 1 is neural and another is hormonal. Neural one has three phases. Cephalic phase, gastric phase and intestinal phase. Okay, three phases in neural control. You must remember in last class I mentioned the cephalic reflex. Anybody remember? What is that? Yes, smell or see, right? When you smell or see the brain sends sig signal to the stomach, right? And secretion occurs in the stomach. So that is the cephalic phase. Seeing, smelling or tasting the food signal goes to the brain from the eye, nose or tongue and your brain sends signal to the stomach, gastric gland to secrete the chemicals. Make sense? So that is cephalic. Cephalic means head. So that is one. When you see the food, this is your eye, okay? this is your nose, smell or taste the food. Huh? No, taste receptors are there. So, it sends signal to the brain and then brain sends signal to the stomach causes the secretion. Cephal. Gastric phase starts after the food arrives in the stomach and 3 to 4 hours after food enters into the stomach what happens? The presence of food stimulate the gastric secretion. So that is the gastric phase because gastric means stomach. The food is already in the stomach. Now another one is the intestinal phase. What is that? You know that from the stomach food enters into the small intestine. The first part of the small intestine is duodenum. So food enters into the duodenum of the small intestine. Now you have the receptors here. They do what? They check the food stuff. They check the food stuff and if they think, if they think that stomach did not do good job, okay, the food pieces are still big, you know, the digestion is not, you know, done perfectly. So, from the intestine, signal will go to the gastric gland, make sense? And tell the gastric glands to do what? Secret more. Because the food stuff I got, I have received, is not well done, you know, digestion is not done well. So, what more? So, from the intestine, the signal will go to the stomach, to the gastric glands, to secrete more. So, that is secretion. Signal is going from the intestine, that is the intestinal phase. So just now, those are the three phases. One is before the food enters into the stomach, even food could be outside of the body, right? Or in the mouth. Smell, seeing or tasting, right? Outside or in the mouth. Secretion occurs in the stomach, that is cephalic. After food arrives in the stomach, secretion occurs, that is gastric. And when the food enters into the, starts to enter into the intestine, it checks the condition and sends signal to the stomach that is intestinal phase. Okay, now we will talk about the small intestine. <coughs> small intestine is mainly for digestion and absorption. 
stomach is mainly for storage and digestion small intestine is mainly for digestion and absorption of nutrients it is a long narrow tube about 2 to 4 meter long and extends from the pyloric sphincter here where the stomach ends to the ileocecal valve that means to the cecum and it has three parts duodenum is the first and shortest part is the duodenum and then uh, the jejunum and ileum only the duodenum is retroperitoneal you must remember intraperitoneal retroperitoneal retroperitoneal is outside of the peritoneal cavity right kidneys are retroperitoneal you remember i said in last class kidneys are located behind the peritoneum right so duodenum part of the small intestine is retroperitoneal so three parts in the small intestine and you see here the small intestine is surrounded by the large intestine <coughs> anyway duodenum has the openings two openings one is for the bile duct another is for the knee uh two openings one is for the bile duct and main pancreatic duct together those two tubes or ducts get together and enter into the duodenum in one opening they join together and enter into one opening that opening for both of those two is called the major duodenal papilla major duodenal papilla for the bile duct as well as main pancreatic duct there is another tiny openings above that opening that one is called minor duodenal papilla that is for the accessory pancreatic duct so what happens this is the main pancreatic duct okay main pancreatic duct the tube and this is the bile duct coming from the liver and gallbladder bile duct they join here just before they enter into the duodenum they join together and enters into the duodenum through this opening one opening that is called major duodenal papilla so the bile comes this way and pancreatic juice to the main pancreatic duct and we take juice from the pancreas okay and then meet here and then enter into the duodenum so bile and pancreatic juice both enter into the duodenum above that there is another tiny opening that is called the minor duodenal papilla from the pancreas this is the main pancreatic duct okay main one from the main pancreatic duct a small branch goes to the duodenum like this and that is the opening for this duct 
the branch and that is the minor duodenal capillary. Now this branch is called accessory pancreatic duct. Pancreatic duct. Okay. This is the main pancreatic duct. Okay, so main pancreatic duct and bile duct they join together. And where they join here you see that part gets wider. And that is the ampulla. Hepatopancreatic ampulla is the wider part of the tube. So hepatopancreatic <coughs> ampulla. When they join together those two bile duct and main pancreatic duct, that part is wider because it receives bile and pancreatic juice both. So that wider part is called the ampulla. Then the ampulla uh, ends at the papilla, major papilla. So here you see from the pancreas the main pancreatic duct and from the liver and gallbladder the bile duct, the green one, they join and then enter into the duodenum. And you see from the main pancreatic duct a branch arises that's the accessory pancreatic duct. Okay, now inside the intestine, small intestine, you will see many circular folds round circular folds. Those are called plica circularis. Plica circularis. And on the plica circularis you have many finger like structures. All those are microscopic. Finger like structure. Those are called villi. So inside the stomach you have circular pores. Plica circularis. And on the plica circularis, you have finger like structures. These are called villi. So, this is this whole thing is plica circularis, and these are villi, finger like. And on the villi, you have hair like structures like this. These are called micro villi, brush border. Okay. So, inside the small intestine, you have those structures. And those structures increase the surface area for absorption because we know that absorption of nutrients occur in the small intestine, right? So, if the surface area is more, more absorption will occur. So, those structures increase the surface area, so the food molecules get more surface to enter into the blood. <coughs> Here, you see Inside the small intestine, you have those circular pores, <coughs> and then villi, and on the villi, you have microvilli. Here you see this finger like structures, those are villi. Villus is singular, villi is plural. And now, inside the villus, you have blood capillaries and lymphatic capillaries. You must remember the capillaries there are to absorb the nutrients. 
because the absorption takes the nutrients into the blood, right? So the blood capillaries are there. Now inside the villus, if I just take one of these, this is these are villi. I take one. This is the villus finger like, and inside you have the blood capillary plexus and the lymphatic capillary. You have food stuffs here, food molecules enter into the blood. Proteins and carbohydrates enter into the blood. Make sense? Most of the fat molecules enter where? Lymphatic. When we talked about the lymphatic system, you remember lymphatic capillaries in the villi are called lacteals, right? So, the lymphatic capillaries are lacteals for the absorption of fats. That's why you have both blood capillaries, you see, and lymphatic capillaries inside the villi. Blood capillaries are for the absorption of small molecules, carbohydrates and proteins, and lymphatic capillaries for large molecules, fats. Those are called lacteals, <coughs> lymphatic capillaries. Okay. In the submucosa of the small intestine, you have aggregated lymphatic follicles. You remember aggregated lymphatic follicles are called Peyer's patches. You must remember when we talked about the lymphatic system, right? You said in the distal part or leg part of a small intestine, you have plenty of lymphatic follicles. Those are called Peyer's patches. And also in the submucosa of the small intestine, you have Brunner's glands. Those are also called duodenal glands and secrete alkaline mucus. Okay. <coughs> Liver is the largest gland in the body. Liver is considered as a gland. Why? Because it produces a number of hormones and liver has four lobes right left quadrant and quadrant qu sorry quadrant and quadrant so right lobe is the largest lobe in the right side that's why we say liver is mostly in the right side of the abdomen, right? Right side, mostly because right lobe is the largest lobe of the liver. Then second larger is the left lobe. Quadrant is rectangular. That's why it is called quadrant. And quadrant, those two lobes are smaller lobes. Now right and left lobes are separated by a ligament. In between those two lobes, you have a ligament that is called the falciform ligament. And this ligament suspends liver from the diaphragm and anterior abdominal wall. Because you see, uh, the liver is here. This is the liver and your diaphragm is here, right? So from the diaphragm, that falciform ligament descends and gets attached to the liver between the right and left lobe and also it goes from the anterior abdominal wall and uh, that's the falciform ligament uh, it gets attached to the diaphragm and the anterior abdominal wall goes down <coughs> now here you see the anterior superior surface of the liver. That means you are looking the front and above. So you see the right lobe is the biggest one and the left lobe you see the falciform ligament. Now quadrate and quadrate those two lobes you don't see from the front or above. You need to look from the bottom. 
So here you see quadrate and quadrant lobes. Okay. Quadrant and quadrant. Which one is rectangular? Quadrant. And another way to identify the quadrant is it is next to the gallbladder. Next to what? The gallbladder. In the lab, if I ask you to identify, that is easy way to remember. Quadrant is rectangular and next to the gallbladder. Quadrant lobe is next to the inferior vena cava. You see a sulcus for inferior vena cava. Clearly, you will see that in the liver. If you go to cadaver lab, you will see a nice depression, sulcus, for the inferior vena cava there. In the model, you will see the inferior vena cava there. So, next to the inferior vena cava, you have the quadrant lobe. Okay, now the area in the liver here, you see the area in the liver, in the bottom of the liver where the <coughs> bile duct, hepatic portal vein and blood vessels hepatic artery, hepatic vein, those blood vessels and bile duct pass through that area that is called the porta hepatis. It is like hilum of the lung. You remember the hilum of the lung? Like the area through which the pulmonary blood vessels, bronchus enter. Very similar area in the liver through which the hepatic portal vein, portal, uh, hepatic artery, hepatic vein, and bile duct, uh, those structures pass, porta hepatis. Now we will see the passage of bile, how the bile flows from the liver to the duodenum, how the bile moves from the liver to the duodenum. Who produces bile? No. Liver. Yeah, that's why I asked. Liver secretes bile. Okay? And from the liver, two hepatic ducts, right and left, hepatic ducts, take the bile out. Hepatic means what? Liver. So, hepatic ducts take the bile out from the liver. Right and left hepatic ducts. Make sense? And then they join outside of the liver, the lower liver and from the common hepatic duct, common means they are joining together. And from the common hepatic duct, a duct goes to the gallbladder. Goes to where? The gallbladder that is called the cystic duct. So, what happens after the bile comes out from the liver, most of the bile will go to the gallbladder through the cystic duct. Most of the bile goes to the gallbladder, and gallbladder does what? Yes. Gallbladder stores, not only stores, make the bile highly concentrated. Gallbladder stores and concentrates the bile. Make sense? How gallbladder concentrates bile? Very simple. Absorbing water. Make sense? Takes the water out from the bile, so it will be concentrated. So, takes a lot of water out from the bile. 
So in the gold product, bile is stored in highly concentrated form. So if you take a drop of bile from the liver and a drop of bile from the gallbladder, which one will be concentrated? The gallbladder, right? Much more concentrated. Anyway, the cystic duct and common hepatic duct, those two ducts join to form the bile duct. So those two ducts join and form the bile duct. And then bile duct goes, it is a long duct, goes all the way down to the outside of the duodenum. And now you must remember, I explained already, just outside of the duodenum, the bile duct and main pancreatic duct, they do what? Join together. Remember? And that area is wider, that is called hepatopancreatic ampulla. Hepato pancreatic ampulla. Ampulla means dilated tube. Okay. Then through the major duodenal papilla, the bile enters into the duodenum. So that is the passage of bile from the liver to the duodenum. Now, when the food arrives in the duodenum, the food you eat that goes to the duodenum, the duodenum can detect what kind of food is that. Is it fat or carbohydrate or protein? Okay and will contract the gallbladder to eject the bile. To digest the fat, you need the bile. Bile helps in digestion of what? Fats. So when you eat fat-rich food, fat-rich food, then the gallbladder will contract forcefully to eject the bile because you have fat rich food right so to digest you need the bile ejection of bile em yeah emulsification is the process how it breaks the large fat molecules right into a small emulsification yeah so that's how the secretion uh, of bile and ejection of bile occurs from the gallbladder. Bile breaks the fat. <coughs> Digestion is the breakdown, yes. Absorption, absorption is helped by the lacteals, lymphatics. Okay, so once digestion, once Yes. How the bile digests or break the fats, that is emulsification, right? Emulsification is the process. What happens, you know, the large fat molecules, these are the fat globules, large. The bile solves, get attached to the surface of the fat, large fat, like this. Okay? Bile salts. Covers. Bile salts cover the fat globules. Okay? And it reduces the surface tension. So, when the movement occurs in the GI tract, the fat will break easily because the surface tension is lost. Make sense? So it will easily break. You know the laundry, when you do the laundry, how the detergents work? Do you know? I don't know. <laughs> the <laughs> detergent <laughs> molecules work like bile salts. Although you don't see, but if you see under the microscope, your, your clothes have a lot of dark molecules, right? Darts. So, the detergent 
detergent molecules will get attached to the surface of the dart molecules. Okay, so if this is the dart, will get attached exactly same way. And then you do what? Spin, right? Mm -hmm. No, it's like in, in your GI tract. Mm -hmm. That will break the dart into many small pieces and will get detached. Bell salts, yes. Uh, sometimes bell salts can get together and get uh, highly concentrated and if you see the gallbladder, this is the gallbladder, okay, and this is the cystic duct. Inside the gallbladder, you have the surface is rough, like regions. The surface is rough, okay, and particularly here, the beginning of cystic duct, that area is really rough, the surface. So, bile salts can accumulate there and stay there. And gradually, they will get highly concentrated and form hard stuff. Yes, that's why we see more uh, stones are formed inside the gallbladder because the surface is not smooth. Okay, uh, there are spaces where the bile salts can accumulate. Okay, so if someone has gallbladder removed, gallbladder is not storing bile. So if you eat a lot of fat rich food, digestion will not occur, makes sense? Then you have to take medicine that will digest the fat. Or you have to eat less fat food. Okay? okay. Uh, inside the liver, if you see under the microscope, very nicely organized. The liver tissue has lobules and lobules are hexagonal structural and functional units. So you will see many hexagonal units, those are the lobules. And the liver processes nutrient rich food, uh, blood, that's why nutrients go Nutrients go from the GI tract to the liver. You remember by hepatic portal circulation, nutrients are taken to the liver because liver is the first organ where most of the nutrients are processed. I mentioned it before. <coughs> Hepatocytes are the cells in the liver and these cells secrete bile. So secretion of bile is the function of hepatocytes. Uh, there are macrophages in the liver, those are called the Kufar cells. So macrophages in the liver, they do phagocytosis, you know that, to destroy the antigens, those are Kufar cells. And inside the liver, you will see bile canaliculi, fine channels of bile. Because you know each liver cell, hepatocyte, secretes bile, right? I said secretion of bile. So you know the cells are very microscopic, right? So the channels that will take the bile out from the cell, right? Away from the cell must be very fine. So many fine channels are connected to each hepatocyte. Now you can think how fine they must be. So those are. So uh, fine channels get together to form a little bit bigger, then they get together to form larger. That way, the bile uh, gets out. Now, you see here, uh, under the microscope, you'll see many hexagonal units. Those are the lobules. And if you see one lobule, it's beautiful. If you just see one lobule, hexagonal, six angles, and in each angle, you have blood vessels, artery, vein, and duct for the bite. 
So for the blood, blood and the bile, we have blood vessels and duct. In each corner, we have those three. And this is called portal triad. We'll see that. Just remember, each corner you have the blood vessels and duct. Each of those six. And in the center, you have the central canal. Where right? you have a vein. Central vein is located. Then, uh, if you see the hepatocytes beautifully present, like going from the central vein towards the periphery outwards, like this, from array, beautiful lines. So these are the hepatocytes, okay? So, hepatocytes. And with each hepatocyte, you have bile canaliculi, like this. How beautifully you see these things are structured. So, it's like the alveoli of the lung. You remember each alveolus gets what? Capillary on it, right? Gas exchange. Each alveolus gets capillary bed. How beautiful. Here, each hepatocyte gets canaliculi. So, the bile can get out from each cell. Here, you see um, the lobule, and you see in each corner you have the artery, vein, and bile duct and that those three structures together bundle together and that is called porta portal triad that i mentioned portal triad functions of the liver uh, processing nutrients i have mentioned already store fat soluble vitamins and perform detoxification. Detoxification is uh, an important function of the liver. Most of the toxic chemicals are detoxified by the secretion of the liver. And the medicine you take, right? Most of the medicines have toxic chemicals too, good chemicals as well as toxic chemicals. And those are detoxified in the liver, most of them. That's why you will see if uh, you read carefully on the you know, medicine container, you will see if you have liver disease or liver problem, talk to your doctor before you take this medicine because your liver may not be able to detoxify, right? neutralize the toxic things. Uh, so you should have taken <coughs> Produce bile um, about 1 liter, 900 milliliters. Some book says 1100, 1200, that's fine. So about 1 liter bile per day. Okay, so bile has two types of chemicals, bile salts and Bilirubin. Bile salts help in the emulsification, breakdown, and absorption of the fats. And bilirubin uh, is yellow colored pigment that comes from the breakdown of hemoglobin. You already know that, right? Red blood cell. Gallbladder is a sac of mus muscle stores and concentrate the bile. We have talked about that. Large intestine has different parts. 
first part is the cecum and a tiny worm like structure is attached to the cecum that is called vermiform appendix small worm like worm like structure and the word vermiform means worm like Then you have colon. Colon has three parts ascending, transverse, descending. So colon has three parts ascending, descending, sorry, ascending, transverse, and descending. And then rectum, and last part is the anal canal. So here you see cecum is the first part, you see the vermiform appendix. Then you see the colon, ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon. Then you have the sigmoid colon. Sorry, after descending, you have another part that is called the sigmoid colon. So colon has four parts, ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid. And then you have the rectum, anal canal. At the end of the anal canal, you have the sphincter, external Anal sphincter. Now, uh, if you see the large intestine from outside, you will see many sacs are in the large intestine. Pocket like structures, many pockets or sacs or pouches, those are called haustra. Haustrum is singular, if I indicate only one. Haustrum. So, haustra is plural. And also, you'll see a band of muscle fibers that is attached to the outside of the large intestine. That band of muscle fibers, concentrated muscle fibers, is called tinea coli. Tinea. Coli. Is it somewhere here? Oh, above the sigmoid column. Yeah, above the sigmoid column, you see that band where you have concentrated muscle fibers, uh, that is tinea coli. And you'll see the fat globules are attached to the tinea coli, and those are called epiploic appendages. The fats hang uh, from the tinea cola. Deploy the disease. So just know those uh, few things. You, uh, here the term uh, appendicitis, right? Very commonly we hear. Appendicitis is the inflammation of appendix itis. Now why appendicitis occurs? very frequently because inside the appendix you have end artery in those structures you have end arteries the blood can accumulate there cannot get out sometimes and can get infected easily so that's why we see inflammation in those organs where you have more end arteries now the problem of appendicitis is when appendicitis occurs, inflammation occurs, the appendix gets big, right? Expands and can burst like a balloon. It can burst, get big, big, big and burst. And if it bursts, that will cause the problem, right? You know that food stops are inside the gastrointestinal tract, right? And inside the gastrointestinal tract, the food stops have microorganisms, right? Toxic chemicals are there, highly toxic. So if the appendix burst, then those toxic chemicals get out, right? And you have big peritoneal cavity here, you know that. So filled with peritoneal fluid. So the toxic chemicals will spread throughout the abdomen, right? And that can cause 
the poison. Yeah, <coughs> and um, yeah, you see mesocolons are the connective tissue membranes that connect the colon to the abdominal wall. Transverse mesocolon is attached to the transverse colon. Sigmoid mesocolon is attached to the sigmoid colon. So you have those mesocolons. Here you see the greater momentum. You remember I said it drafts down from the greater curvature. They did here. They have actually, you know, moved the greater momentum up like this because other end is hanging. So you can just move it up uh, like this and show in our organ. Okay. So they have moved the greater momentum upwards. Actually, it should drop down. Rectum, uh, anal canal, and in the anal canal, you have two splinters, internal and external. External is skeletal muscle and internal is smooth muscle. Which one is voluntary? What do you think? Which muscle is voluntary? Yes. External is voluntary because we know that its skeletal muscle is voluntary, right? The smooth muscle is involuntary. So what happens during defecation? This is the anal canal, this is the external skeletal, this is internal, splinter is smooth. So skeletal. This is voluntary. This is involuntary. So when we decide to defecate, we voluntarily relax the skeletal muscle. So when we relax this, the signal goes to the spinal cord. See that? Okay. And we cannot relax this one because this is involuntary. So when a spinal cord receives that signal, that external is open, then it will send signal to the internal. Okay. And we will relax this one. So when both are relaxed, uh, that will help in defecation. The last organ, pancreas. Let's finish this one. So pancreas <coughs> produces two types of chemicals. It's a mixed gland. We know that. Why it is called a mixed gland? It has both endocrine and exocrine parts, right? That's why it is mixed. The endocrine part is pancreatic islets. And exocrine part is pancreatic assigning or assigner part. So this is endo, this is exo. The endocrine part produces two important hormones, insulin and glucagon. Insulin and glucagon. Insulin does what? Decreases blood sugar, right? That's why diabetic patients take insulin to lower the blood sugar. Glucagon does just opposite increases the blood sugar. So by the action of those two, your blood sugar is maintained, right? If blood sugar goes up, insulin will be released more. If down, glucagon will be released more. So regulation of blood sugar is the function of the pancreatic islet, endocrine part. The exocrine part produces gastric juice. Oh, sorry, pancreatic Gastric juice is put by gastric part. And create it. Juice. Exocrine part. And pancreatic juice has all different types of digestive enzymes. Amylase. Lipase. Protease. So, to digest carbohydrates, fats, and 
proteins. In pancreatic juice, you have all three types of enzymes. So that's the pancreas. Okay. Okay. So let's stop here.